Hi, Glenn. How are you doing? Hi, David, and uh, good to see you again uh, for another discussion on the leading strategy paper series um, and the latest five papers uh, we have, which are strategy as process. Now, the, I, I found this, this particular series really interesting. Obviously, we had Eisenhart's strategy as strategic decision making, Sull's why do good companies go bad, uh, Katzenbeck and Smith with discipline of teams, Kaplan and uh, Beinhocker, uh, the real value of strategic planning, and then Mintzberg and Waters of strategies deliberate and emergent. And that last one, I have to say, was, was my particular favourite. Um, <laughs> Just because, I mean, I like that one particularly because having been a strategy consultant and, and that sort of discourse around, well, you know, strategy can be planned, but yeah, not so much emergence. Absolutely. And, you know, as you know, that's my background as well. So as a strategy director, trying to do strategy in large organisations and very much strategy process was also the topic of my doctorate in strategy. So this is, this is a area very much close to my heart and this you know, idea that what is, what is strategy process? Now you're in a situation where you're a newly merged organisation thinking well in the long we bang these organisations together as one of my old chief executives used to say well what then? Where are we going to go to and how are we going to bring these new teams together? Or equally, you know, if you're a, a major steel um, manufacturer, you know, faced with a economic shock where you know, your previous strategy needs to be rethought, well, what happens? And so often you hear managers, general public, well, strategy is made by this plan. Now, you, you do the analysis somehow, and then, well, that throws up options, and you, either the team or the chief executive, decides what you're going to do, and great, pass it on for implementation. Away we go. Make it so would be the Star Trek equivalent. And of course, you and, you and me know that the real world's not like that. And what well, everyone says, well, you, know, you ask them, well, great, that's how you make strategy then. How do you get on with it? They all say, oh, we're useless at it. We can't do it. Well, there's a reason why you can't do it, because the way it's envisaged does not fit with human nature. Mm. And the unpredictability and complexity of the external environment, but also the internal environment within the firm. You, know, you get much above... 50 people in a firm and the complexity starts to go up um, exponentially. As a management team, you cannot understand the detail, what's happening in the front line or in your IT department or in procurement, to sufficient detail with sufficient expertise that you could program that organisation the way you would with a computer. You know, we all know the classic examples of organizations that have tried that in the past you know the the uh the old rand corporation um and the um <laughs> the, the the people they brought into ford and then they went on into the defense department in the u.s and tried to run the vietnam war that way you know, surprise surprise what happened through these wonderful programmed models and, and plans for no resemblance what people were planning on the front line. Yeah, and mistakes are made. Yeah. Well we uh, see that we see that as well in the um, you know the quality management for those who are interested, there's some quality management videos on the channel as well. And when we look at the way measures, metrics are formed, and I was thinking particularly when you were talking there about the Wang Laboratory's SMART model, which is we set the numbers at the top and they're passed down through middle management, lower management to the the ground floor where they do the work and then they feed the result up uh, and the idea that somehow that would ever work <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you no know, all organizations of any size will have a strategic planning process 
Now, if it was completely irrelevant and completely a complete waste of time, well, this approach would have been consigned to history a long time ago. Yeah, it would have been as a, another article coming along in a few weeks' time, uh, there would have been a product recall on it. Um, but if you then think, all right, so we're not doing a deliberate linear planned approach, well, strategist emerges then. We just let the organization free form and out of that mass, a strategy will somehow evolve. And of course, that view, although quite trendy at certain points in the past, has its own problems. You know, that actually, the idea that a mutual direction will occur out of a large number of people doesn't provide the coherence for an organization to achieve things. And after all, that's what organizations are for, to achieve some aims. You know, we can debate what the aims are, but to achieve some aims. And as part of that, having some sort of deliberate aim, some sort of end goal or vision is needed to pull everyone in the same direction. You know, and so this is where, this is an interesting area to explore, well, how far towards that more planned approach, as Mintzberg and Waters would call it, that deliberate approach, or just how emergent are you in terms of the strategy? And the reality is that the, the realized strategy, you know, what the firm pattern of activities are that comes out of its strategy, actually it's a mixture of both. Mm. So yes, there are some deliberate aspects to strategy, which you know, careful thought and analysis has gone into, and that has flowed through into plans and into actions. But at the same time, because the world is changing and you can't quite understand it all, and because learning appears as you try to do things, as well in that real life strategy, there's these bubbling up of good ideas and patterns of choices that happen in the organization and end up taking the organization in a direction. You now, so to me as a strategy director, and I'm sure you saw that this in your uh, consulting days, well, how can you guide you know, the, the planned part straightforward, although getting managers to slightly pull back on their expectations of what they can plan and what they can't is a, um, a, a challenge. But then a lot of the issue is, well, how do you get that emergent side of strategy to at least have some cohesion and direction around it? Now, that's where these articles, I think, are quite, quite interesting because you know, they stem across, well, in terms of the process by which that more organic view of strategy takes place. Um, the dynamics of the decision-making team. Is it a team or does it need to be a team or is it just a working group? Um, and then also this whole wonderful area of cognitive frameworks, you know, how people think and how that influences their thinking and the need to be aware of it. Not to say that cognitive frames are necessarily a bad thing. There they are a part of us as humans and are often go, go right back in evolution back to well, how do you spot the saber-toothed tiger coming over the brow of the hill and know quickly enough that you've got to, got to run while well, that's through your brain is filtering out a lot of the information that is bombarding you all the time. You pick up the things you, you your experience has told that you are important. And so those cognitive frames are part of thinking quickly, but they can also be blinders and restrictions on what you do think about and the way you think about things. So, so just staying with, you know, I suppose having read or, you know, listened to your videos this week, and reflect on some of the work I've done on, on you know, I was particularly interested in Toyota, because um, I did, a lot of the early work on lean, uh, I was lucky enough to work on, you know, the first UK lean aerospace initiative and and then on the European five day car programs where we were working and trying to push lean forward. And one of the things that sort of stuck with me was Toyota having sort of a hundred year strategy and a short term, and a, you know, but to plan that far out 
and they knew it wouldn't happen, but they liked to have this idea that they thought about it. In your experience, both as an academic and as a strategy professional for big companies, what sort of timelines were you planning to? Okay, so the, the issue is not so much planning to, but how far out could you get um, executives to engage with? Yeah, yeah. So my view was always that you get beyond 15 years out and they're going to not treat it seriously. Yeah, and so whilst it might be intellectually interesting, it doesn't, in their mind, impact directly what you're doing. Now, in a, um, a electricity generating company, where your investment horizon is likely to be that sort of time period, then you'd probably have a different experience of what that top end is. But so in the businesses I was working in, trying to think that far out, 15 years, was far too long. Um, Managers are more aware of what's going to happen in the next one to three years. Now, again, that's a, a feature of the way in which we think. We prioritise the short term over the long term, even though we know full well actually something happening in five years time that is, it might be more important, we still go to the short term event, which is less important. You know, our minds are set up to think that way. Back again to our survival instinct, anyways, but that's the nature. So strategies and environmental trends take time to play out. And in my head, I was always working with a 10 year horizon in my head, but to make it pal palatable, I'd probably always be talking about five plus years. Hmm. So long enough such that the trends and um, directions you were seeing had time to play out but you were positioning it closer to the present so that those engaging in the strategy process can see the relevance and feel it is meaningful to their time with that organization so with you know, I use an awful lot of scenario planning work and so I was looking to write five to ten year scenarios of what would happen in a particular industry. Uh, you know, the variety of futures that are out there that could happen given what we were seeing in the macro and the industry environment. That had that five year period was 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 also good from the point of view of getting outside of today's politics and um, um, specific area issues. It meant that the exec team could put aside a lot of their current disagreements and come together around a shared view of the future. And so by and scenarios was great as well. The particular views could be parked in one scenario, or someone else's views in another scenario, and they all knew that their particular bugbears, hot issues, were being um, taken into the decision-making process. And then, of course, from there, at that five to ten-year period, this is where I'd be using things that are very rational stuff, you know, around balanced scorecard, for example, be using that as a way to say, okay, so that's where we're aiming to be. Let's define that in more detail by talking about, well, what does that look like? And therefore, what are the dimensions of that? And let's put some sort of scale on that. You know, suddenly are into a balanced scorecard. I, must admit, I wasn't using the exact Kaplan and Norton version, but something that the executives I was working with had bought into. And so let's use that. And then from there, you can start to bring it back towards the current day. And you can start to say, well, you've agreed that. What's happening today about that? But not always in terms of plans. There's also then, right, how we bringing the organization into that way of thinking what are we doing in terms of as we've talked as seen in these articles you know from from eisenhardt's uh, perspective well how are we building a collective intuition around these these things how are we able to take some decisions now but still keep talking about other issues <coughs> excuse me um around the 
well, what are we missing? What are we not missing? And so, and then linking in you know, a lot of work with the um, HR director around both in terms of the, the team you're working with. So discussions around strategy were as important to that dynamics of the top team, but also then um, how are you involving the next levels of management in the process of thinking what it meant, what the overall direction meant for their parts of the business. And again, the HR director is going to be interested in terms of the development of strategic thinking amongst that next set of management team. So were you seeing, you know, reflections of Katzenberg and Smith's paper when you were doing that? Yes, absolutely. Um, you do have to be very careful around calling groups teams. Mm. You know, so there are situations and you know, that might, might change from um, context to context, but also over time where actually that top group, you don't really want working as a team. You know, there are, they have their day jobs and trying to pretend you're a team is almost as bad as trying to say you are a team. But certainly around coming to that shared view of the future, it was very valuable. You know, them seeing themselves having this common purpose um, and linking that down into finding what it meant and into some sorts of goals you know, and seeing them all mutually responsible for it was you know, a fundamental part of the dynamics of a successful, successful team. Um, but I think that um, Katzenbach and Smith article is interesting from the point of view, just those dynamics that are going on amongst the top, top teams, you've got to be very aware of when is appropriate for what sort of dynamic. Okay, so I mean that's really interesting trying to put these papers in perspective. And I just going going back a step, why did you choose these these particular uh, papers? Okay, so um, what I've tried to do with these was I knew I wanted to cover the Mintzberg and Waters paper. You know, it is a classic starting point for trying to break out of this strategy process is just about a plan. Yeah, you know, and also at that stage, you know, this was before Mintzberg wrote the rise and fall of strategic planning, where he becomes even more critical of the deliberate approach to planning. You know, so it just doesn't fit where managers are. And that planning approach has failed so spectacularly, he becomes more critical of it. I think in that Mintzberg paper in 85, you know, you know we're talking a long time ago, but he, he's presenting, well, they are talking about a more balanced need. So you need both effectively. Um, so that was where I wanted to get to. I was also very aware that people were very, well, um, managers, students have always by default went to this more deliberate, rational view of where strategies came from. And so I wanted to start off with a article that came from a different perspective. And Eisenhart, and it's one article she's done with a number of authors um, on this theme. And there is some deeper articles she's done, and it's appeared in California Management Review and elsewhere, that if viewers are interested, it's worth going and look at those articles, more detail on her research. Uh, but she very much is coming from this idea that strategy is developed in a more organic way. And her research has been mainly around high velocity markets at that stage, so high tech markets, where decision timeframes are shorter and you're taking lots and lots of decisions sometimes on the fly. But her view here is where traditional thinking was that, well, that means quality decision making goes down because you're taking decisions very quickly. Her research showed that successful firms, no, they do it a different way. They still have time for this time. They still delve into decisions. They just made sure that the process is working effectively. And you do have this engagement across the management team. Um, linking to that view of strategy, you do have to find, indeed, into any strategy process, you need to think about the whole 
question of cognitive frames. You know, Simon's classic works about cognitive frameworks. You know, managers are the product of the, their background. So they, you know, the culture they come from, the experiences they've had, their education, what's worked, what's not worked in the past, what industry they're in, those all create filters in terms of the information that people will perceive as being important, but also of the options that might work as solutions for things. So bounded rationality. So you will make decisions within you know, rationally to a degree, but that rationality is bounded by those cognitive frames. So you won't do um, look at all the information that's bombarding you. You'll just pick out some of it. Um, you will um, search until you find a solution that satisfies, rather than going on to find every solution so you can find the most optimal one. Um, those options you consider will be things that you've probably tried in the past, you know, the tried and tested way of doing things that you adopt. So when you are thinking about strategy, you need to be aware of both the benefits that that brings you in terms of faster decision making, you know, in an operational sense, well, that's probably how you want to act. But when you're trying to open up your thinking, you need to be aware of where those cognitive limitations are. Now the Sull article, whilst it is focuses on companies that failed, in that it highlights these cognitive frames, which affect all organizations. So in your process of strategy, how are you working to try to open up the thinking? You know, how are you bringing in different perspectives? Um, how are you getting the management team to share their own views? But then what's the way in which you get those challenged, but also new insights coming into this? And here's where I see you know, it's a big link to your video discussion with Chris around um, critical realism. Mm. The fact that we have a view of what reality is, but reality is much more complicated than that. That just through our experiences, we're really um, understanding part of it. Well, how do we open those, that understanding out to other areas? And this is where a lot of the frameworks we've talked we talked about in the Recon Leading article at the beginning, you know, that um, core competencies are about portals, what is strategy or dynamic capabilities. These are tools, frameworks that have come from very different the reality of where competitive advantage comes from in that case. So what by using those tools, what you're doing in the process is you're looking at reality from a different set of assumptions and that opens up your understanding and so hopefully in your decision making you take you get over some of these these blinds on your thinking you know these the fact that you're into set routines and you know, you're trapped by what your customers want um, it means you have a well, hopefully get a wider perspective on that yeah, that that speaks to the the so, something else I'm quite interested in is dominant logic. Yep, and, you know, absolutely. If, absolutely. You know. yeah, the old key, the QWERTY keyboard story. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a way of designing typewriters back in the 1800s. So the space of the keys meant that the arms that typed onto the page don't jam. And so this was the most efficient way to lay out the letters. But of course, you know, people trained on these typewriters, got faster and faster on it. If, you know, as the technology came, first you got um, ball, golf ball type, type, and now we're into apps and um, uh, mobile devices and computer keyboards where there's no limitations at all on the way you lay a, your keyboard. But a hundred years later, we're still looking down and see QWERTY on our typewriter. The dominant logic, because it's built this ecosystem around uh, around that development, it means it's extraordinarily difficult to change the way you do things. And you can see that in you know, everything from the design of cars to uh, uh, everything around you. To break out of that you know, is, is, is difficult. 
and that's really where Chan and Chan and Chan and um, Kim Chan and sorry Chan Kim and Ray Mulberg's ideas of Blue Ocean. They suggest you can break out of that. Mm -hmm. As we talked about before, Christensen. They say, well, even though it might be obvious that a new player is coming along and going to take your market, you still might not be able to. Um, respond to it because of the rationality of the decisions you're making in your existing industry. But that, that's that strategy. That's where strategy gets interesting. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we we've, we've sort of touched on eyes and heart and soul. Um, cats and backs. Cats and backs. That's the other area about. It's not just the individual behaviours. It's not just about the process, but the dynamics of the team who are making choices around the strategy are just as important. Now, this is where some of my own research with Andrew Pettigrew was around these, what made certain companies more agile, um, um, ahead of others in an industry. Now, we were looking at, or, or looking at these dilemmas around three areas where it wasn't a case of being at one end of the spectrum or the other you have to be at the right point on the spectrum around the formality of the processes in in the firm the embeddedness of the top management team into the industry culture and this thing about dynamics of the top team you know, so how open or how action orientating it's it's geared does everyone come to the same background or not? Have you got a mixture of new and um, new people coming from other industries with people in your own industry? And these were dilemmas that you had to resolve to ensure your strategy was um, ahead of the game, if you like. So this was this was the Katz and Back and Smith article starts to make you think about these issues of dynamics of the top team or the strategy making unit. It and then having, then having done some articles around this more organic, emergent view of strategy, I felt, well, hang on a moment. Aren't we saying through this, well, we should give up on that deliberate approach to strategy? Why are all these firms still doing annual strategy plans? And I thought the Kaplan and Bian Hocker article, whilst not a classic article, and um, I forgot about it, it did touch on an area I'm sure we've both spent a lot of time involved in, you know, the annual strategic planning process. So if it's all a waste of time, why are we all doing it? This I thought was a nice take on this and something I'd come to view in my time, that the strategic planning process was as much a learning process and a way of getting buy-in within the organisation to what it was trying to do. You know, instead of by managers going through the process, they got to understand more of what it would take to deliver and also personally committed to it. And so now you might not get to the end of the next year and your plan is very different, but the intent and the effort has gone to tell us taking that organisation forward. Yes, it's learned along the way, but it's saying that, well, maybe strategic planning is not quite a waste of time that sometimes we perceive it as being, but it does mean you need to think differently about it within inside the organization. Now, I also thought as, as a consultant, you know, we were, we had a number of roles. Sometimes we were just providing evidence to support somebody's idea, which was the least interesting thing we did. <laughs> um, but often we were either being brought in as you know, you didn't want to change the team, but you needed to expand those knowledge horizons. So you could bring in strategy consultants who would bring a new perspective and help shape that strategy. And that might be part of an annual strategy review. And in doing that, you know, even working as a you know, private strategy consultancy, I find that why do they want me? Actually, they want a different way of thinking for that annual strategy review just to broaden the horizon so that they don't need to change the team which is you know the, often the way when you you do mergers and acquisitions you, you're losing people bringing new people in to try and refresh it but actually you can just bring some consultants in they can challenge the status quo challenge the thinking bring new ideas which may or may not be rejected but it reinvigorates that process gets the the 
the C-suite team thinking about the business and what happens during that year happens, but hopefully there's been learning, there's been development and a bit more dynamism thrown into the mix. Absolutely. I mean, it's, well, I mean, there are other views on, on what consultants bring and uh, the, the, what was it, Mickle, Mickleber and uh, I can't remember their name in terms of, you know, consultants are just witch doctors brought in to tell you what you already know. But um, there is value in terms of this outside view. And it does mean you've got to be, got to be clear on what you do want from the consultants coming in and making sure they are bringing in that knowledge you need. But on this, this, this role of formal, formal approaches, I'm very um, mindful here of the way Shell used to use scenarios. So yeah, the whole story about Shell and the and scenarios helping them to predict that the oil prices were going to shift dramatically and so Shell was able to then take advantage of that. That view misses the fundamental point of what was happening there. What really was the benefit was they produced these scenarios but then through formal exercises they worked with managers throughout the business asking what if. So if this happened what would we do? And if this happened, what would we do? You know, these are equally likely scenarios. So we can't say one's a forecast or not. But by doing that exercise, when managers started to see the, the signals that something was happening, they didn't automatically dismiss it. So back into that comfort thinking that rejecting the information, it was hang on a moment, hang on, something's happening here. We better be more aware of what could happen here than our rivals. And that means they were able to respond more quickly when change really was happening than their rivals. You can make a connection into special forces in the military. You know, why do you train? Well, it's when you're in the real situation, you're able to adapt and know how others are going to adapt to the situation you're facing. There's a, a real sort of value in strategic planning outside the instrumental uh, yeah. oh I mean, if you're just doing it instrumentally you, you're probably better off forgetting it you know, there is the, the value industry planning as Kaplan and Bian Hocker are saying is in it as a learning process um, I think a nice example they use around and I've, I've seen this uh, you probably have as well where in terms of links to M&A so if you have, you know, if you're a subsidiary with a, a headquarters group uh, company, if the leadership of the subsidiary and that of the group have, through a planning discussion, explored potential of an acquisition, you know, maybe as um, the authors there talk about in terms of moving into Germany and two big um, acquisition targets that came up, when that became a re real opportunity, because they'd gone into depth of discussing this process, they were able to act quickly, quicker than their rivals, and actually knew how to, to price the offer they're going to make. And so because, of, and they were on the same page. You know, there's none of this, hey, this opportunity, what are we going to do about this? And that different position you'd find a subsidiary in group in, no, they were clear cut, probably been shared with the board already that that was part of the thinking that had gone through. So when it happened, the whole organization was able to move an awful lot quicker. That's, I mean, I think this is a really interesting perspective on strategy that's maybe not shared enough. Um, it, it does always get presented as instrumental or, or blue sky thinking, but there's this really practical um application of it like you say getting people thinking moving people away from their their fixed dominant logic so that they can be more adaptable when when faced with new challenges well this is where i always like to um present strategy as being a set of tools and a set of instruments a doctor might have you know and so you are using these tools to build your understanding and gain insight you know, so that as I've talked about on where does competitive advantage come from? Well, it's a whole complex array of 
things. You can't nail that down into a single uh, machine and wind the handle and out pops the answer for this. What you need to be doing is thinking, right, let's look at it from these different perspectives you know, and stick with the tool. Okay, so Michael Porter, okay, he's thought of a lot by many people. What would he say on this? Come, come and help us, Michael. Okay, you can't come in person, but we've got your thinking. So stick with him, don't try and add to it or try to push a square into a round hole. What does that tell me about what's happening here? Thanks, Mike. Nice to have your views. Okay, Jay Barney. Give me a hand with this, will you? you know, what's happening here? Oh, so resources. You know, have we got any unique resources? You know, are they, how is it to copy them, etc.? Okay, great. Now, those insights coming out of that then go into the process of decision making. So back to your critical realism perspective, you're armed with a wider perspective of the reality you're facing. With that wider perspective, maybe you will see some better opportunities or able to see where you need to take action. Same thing in strategy process. Now you can't design or expect to design this computer program about how to do strategy process. Okay, we know that there are deliberate elements to it. We know there's emergent elements to it. Right, let's think about this from a deliberate perspective. Now, what, what are Kaplan and Beinhock are saying about what makes a good deliberate approach to planning? Thank you. Okay, let's think about from this more emergent perspective. How can we nudge, guide the organisation to so the strategy that does emerge is aligned to where we want this organisation to go? That provides us other insights. And then we borrow those insights into what we then do to take real decisions. They don't tell us what to do, but if they told us what to do as managers, why would we ever be paid, paid money? You know, all right, you wind the handle out, pops the answer. We do that, well, where's the value add that a manager and the experience and the intuition that a manager has adding value? So, that practical use is absolutely essential. So that really, I mean, that really does summarise that 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 Mintzberg and Waters thinking around, you know, deliberate and emergent strategies and being aware of the synergies of both. Um, yeah, but don't, don't again, don't make a Frankenstein model out of them. Mix them all up together, you'll get lost. Now the beauty is in these is keeps it simple by keeping them separate. Mm. Now except in your head that, yeah, I know it's both. But for the moment, I'm just going to look at it from this perspective. I'm not going to forget about the other perspective because that's where I'm now going to go look at it. But you keep, you don't get confused. You don't, you don't get too complex and you get lost in it all. Yeah. So I think, I mean, for those, those who've been following or, or those who want to come, view, I think this, this particular week's set of papers are really super interesting from from a practice and also from a deeply academic perspective, it's really combined those two things because, you know, we, we, we speak about critical realism, you know, which is an epistemological view of strategy, we, which is a fairly academic type way of thinking. But, but if we take strategy as a philosophy, it allows us to, to think about the dominant logic, about the way people think, about the way people perceive the world and adopting different viewpoints can help you change your company adapt your company uh, and expand the thinking of, of your managers such that when they are faced with novel and challenging times like you know we're sitting here at the moment in the middle of a uh, a pandemic it's it is a challenging time to evolve strategies but actually there's definitely going to be new opportunities uh, for people to exploit yeah and we will probably need to to change the way we envisage our markets the way we do business going forward. We might not, but we can't just accept one or other of those. You know, we, we need to think them through and the tools of strategy help us to do that. At the end of the day though, as managers, we still have to decide. That's a great place to leave it. <laughs> great series. Thank you so much for talking us through that. And I hope to see the, the listeners will really enjoy it. All right. Take care, Edmund. Thanks, David.